ever wondered exactly what it was that your ancestors ate? I know I have, and I've gotten some recipes from my grandparents, but going back even further, I really get curious about what it was that my ancestors ate. Well, I was excited to find a food ethnographer and Pennsylvania resident, Dr. William Moise Weaver, who explains, well, first of all, what food ethnography is, uh, that intersection between food and culture, and then also the kinds of foods that Pennsylvanians ate throughout our state's history. So I hope that this episode gets you inspired to start a garden, maybe some of those heirloom vegetables, those odd vegetables that we can't quite find in grocery stores, but at local farm stands here in Pennsylvania. William's going to share some of that Pennsylvania food history and how we can take that into our future. William Moise Weaver, I want to welcome you to the podcast. I was really excited to find you and your work because you study sort of this history of the intersection between food and people. You do food ethnography. Is that correct? Do I have the right term for it? That's, for... that's absolutely the right term. Do you want me to explain it right now? I, or... I'd love for you to explain it and introduce yourself to people and ex- share mm-hmm. how you got into this because it's it's honestly really cool. I'm kind of jealous. <laughs> well, the the humor of this is I, I went to the University of Virginia to become an architect and I have a degree in architecture. Talk about getting on the boat to a different planet. Food ethnography is what my doctorate's in. I could not get that degree in the United States, so I was invited to take my degree at University College in Dublin, Ireland, because we could get creative with whatever it is I wanted to do. They could sort of tailor it. So what's food ethnography? Well, It's the study of the people. In other words, we turn tables. Gastronomy folks talk about the food and the recipes. The ethnographers talk about what does it mean? We're sitting around the table eating turkey at Thanksgiving. Why? So we're interested in the why, not the what, but also in the what, because it's all interrelated. But it's a It's really about the social history of us and also the human psychology of food. Mm. How's that for a mouthful? (laughs) I love it because we can't separate people in food, right? Like, no, yeah, we, we have to have it every day. And it means so much symbolically or whatever to so many different people. It, it, it really, it, Well, the whole basic idea behind food ethnography is food defines our culture, who we are as people and why we do what we do. And religion plays into this, all sorts of things, gender, jobs, farming, you name it. It's all part of a sort of holistic way of looking at it. So that's basically food ethnography. And of course, it sounds like a very fuzzy Uh, topic. And it is because there are all sorts of people around the edges of this doing their own little thing. I mean, there are people doing studies of the food ethnographies of the Middle Ages. And, you know, these people are dead. They're long since gone. But there's something called historical ethnography. And you can go into records and sort of eke out information about people and why they did what they did. Interesting. I I wanted to have you on the podcast because I was curious about, and I thought maybe other people were too, about people in Pennsylvania in particular and what they used to eat. You know, because right now, like if I drive to Iowa, I could probably find similar food there and here, right? Like there's a a Chinese restaurant and there's a pizza place and there's a, a sandwich shop and but the food maybe was different back in the 1700s or 1800s in Pennsylvania compared to Boston or Georgia. Oh, very definitely so. And in fact, apropos your your Iowa example, I also have been to Iowa, mainly because Seed Savers Exchange is located there and I've lectured for them. And I've driven through Iowa and I've driven through all that GMO corn and I stopped at a market 
And I thought, oh good, I'm gonna get some Iowa veggies. Are you kidding? Everything was shipped in from California. Now, you and I can drive up the road to a farmer's market and we can buy things grown right here in our own state. And what makes us special is that we've got over 6,000 family farms and they sell directly to us. And that's what makes Pennsylvania special and why we've been able to hang on to a lot of our food traditions because we've got the farmer's markets. And by the way, Pennsylvania is the third most important agricultural state in the US in food production after California and Florida. Did you know that? <laughs> I did not. Yes, and we don't ship our food to foreign, or, you know, foreign places in boxes. We sell it directly to our own folks or to New York, Washington, Baltimore. So our whole, our, our whole culinary story is sort of based on this very strong family farm tradition, which goes right back to the 18th century and, and all of the, the genealogical work that's been done on all the different groups who settled here. And we'll mention shortly Dr. Don Yoder, who was a famous genealogist in Pennsylvania. He was a professional Pennsylvanian, let's just put it that way. <laughs> but anyhow, I don't wanna to wander too far from your question. Let's talk about Don Yoder because you brought him up. You've done some books with him around food. Um, yes, actually, he was my cousin. It was my father's, I was related to my father. So he was more or less a great uncle figure to me. That's sort of the role we had. When I got into school in college, our interests began to really coincide. And he was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania. And well, one thing just led to another. We became very, very close friends. And um, he was always going to Europe to do research on Pennsylvania Dutch family history, Switzerland and Germany in particular. But he also went to Wales and England because he was interested in the Quakers and the other groups who came here. And he wrote lots of books on the genealogy of Pennsylvania and uh, they're, they're sort of basic research. When he died, I, it took me three, no, four years to sort his papers. I inherited his, his papers because he had, he had no heirs for that sort of thing. We sorted them out and we've sent them up to Kutztown University. And once they get the new library, all of his genealogical research will be available for people to go and use. And there's just a lot of material that's never been published. So just put that on the back burner because it'll be an incredible archive for people doing family history in this region. Oh, that's going to be a destination for folks. Oh, it will be. Yeah. Well, Kutztown is creating a new library and all of this material will go there. Then they, they're, they're going to raise money so they can get someone to catalog all this because... Don Yoder never had a catalog. It was all in his head, you know? And so to get it all arranged, so people going to take five or six years. But anyway, it yeah. will be a destination. Oh, I, I'm laughing as you're saying this, and I'm trying to do it quietly because I think everyone listening to this who's collected documentation on their families and things has stacks of <laughs> papers that yes. they haven't quite, you know, organized. So... Now I feel less guilty. If Don Yoder did it, then I don't feel so bad for doing it. Oh, he was, he was a master at disorganization. <laughs> <laughs> so back to your research, what would be some food or recipes that if we wanted to kind of recreate our ancestors' life in Pennsylvania, what would be some, maybe some signature things that we would think about? Well, I think we, we have a number of historical sites that like Landis Valley Farm Museum, what have you, already sort of reenactments of regional recipes and foods. I would say if that particular aspect of your family history interests you, then I would visit some of these open air museums and see what's going on. Because once you go there, you're gonna, you're gonna network with people who are on site. And if you have a family from Lancaster County and you talk to the people at Landis Valley, they may know somebody who knows somebody and you, it, the ball starts to roll and you get into 
all kinds of food ways. Well, I wrote three books on Pennsylvania Dutch foods, Pennsylvania Dutch country cooking, which is out of print, but you can get it online at Amazon. As American as shoe fly pie, which explains the whole history, cultural history of the Pennsylvania Dutch. That's available from the University of Pennsylvania Press and then Dutch Treats, which is a little baking book, which you can buy from us, but we can talk about that later. Anyway, my point is I've been, I've been focusing on the Pennsylvania Dutch because the, the, we have five food regions in Pennsylvania. I know you wanted to get into that, yes. And the Pennsylvania Dutch one is the biggest. It, it's not just Lancaster County, it's 25 counties. All right, it's the big chunk in the middle of the state of 25 counties. And probably many of your listeners are living in those 25 counties. And this is an area the size of Switzerland. And when you think about that, all the diversity of foods in Switzerland, well, we've got the same thing here. In order to do my, my doctorate in Ireland, I had to come up with a PhD paper. And so I went out in the countryside and I interviewed people about recipes and cooking and family traditions and all of that, which resulted in As American as Shoe Fly Pie, that book. So, you know, you can take, take a stuffed pig stomach, which is a, sort of a classic Pennsylvania Dutch dish, not always easy to find anymore, but if you start talking to families, people make it at home a lot, but York County people do it differently than Union County and, you, and the people over the next hill do it even different again. So what you discover is that, oh, there's not uh, one uh, stuffed pig stomach, there are 50, all these different recipes and variations, which is what I love because it's all about the different ways we, we do things. And so I, I went into up in Schuylkill County and uh, up in that area of the state and was interviewing people. And they have a funny little pie called fish pie, but it's not made with fish. <laughs> it's a sort of a molasses pie that has a very curious history. And I've got the recipe, by the way, in my book, Dutch Treats. So what you discover is that in this area of the Dutch country, there are all kinds of little sub-regional dishes that make that particular area special. The other, let's start with the beginning, Philadelphia region is, is a one, and that includes Northern Delaware and Southern New Jersey and the, the donuts <laughs> counties around the city because those were settled by Quakers and it's a kind of a different culinary tradition. Then we move north, we've got the Northeast part of the state and that would be the Wilkes-Barre Scranton area. Now we've got the Dutch country, and then we've got the Allegheny Highlands, which is, let's say Pittsburgh is centered on that, but it runs sort of up the backbone of the state all the way to New York. And this area was settled uh, uh, by a lot of Scotch Irish. So their, their cooking traditions are totally different from the Pennsylvania Dutch. And then the Lakeshore, what we call the Lakeshore District, which is that those counties that are clustered up around Erie and, and uh, Lake Erie. So those are our basic regions and we made a map, but we, we did it by county and it, it, it's not really accurate because the ethnographic map is very different. For example, Bucks County was settled by Quakers on the bottom half, but the top half was Pennsylvania Dutch. We don't cut Bucks County in half, okay? If we followed these little township lines, it would be a really jagged map of, uh, if we followed settlement patterns, let's put it that way. So those are, the, those are the main food regions. And the goal of the Roughwood table, which is going to become the Roughwood Foundation, is that we will turn this house that I'm in, which was built as a tavern, into a learning center for our regional food studies. And people can come here and we'll be able to take cooking classes on the foods from all these different regions. Now, some of the Pennsylvania regions have not been well researched. I've done the Dutch. I also did a Quaker woman's cookbook and I'm working on a Philadelphia thing. I mean, I just don't have the time to go out to Greensburg or out in that part of the state and do, do the kind of research that needs to be done. But one of our board members is from out there and she's done a book on salt raised bread, 
which was something in the Allegheny Highlands that those people made. So if you want to get nostalgic about your Scotch-Irish um, ancestors, there's, there's one of the recipes that you can use. Also, I have in my next book, Allegheny fardle cakes, which are little pancakes made out of potatoes. And that's another Scotch-Irish dish from that, that area. So I think gradually, once we get this center set up, we're right now going through the IRS birthing process. <laughs> I won't say it's fun, but you know, that's the government. And once we get this thing up and running, we're going to get grants to pay scholars to do field work in these different areas so that we can get a better grasp of what's going on out there because we know a lot of people are out there. One of the things that's made me very sad about this whole COVID issue is that it's taken away some really wonderful old people who should have been interviewed. And we've lost an incredible chapter of our history right there within a year. And this is a terrible loss because I wanted to spend some time in some of these homes with these people talking about their food memories. I did that up in, in central Pennsylvania and it was a wonderful experience. But anyhow, that's the card we have to deal with right now in terms of research. And I have to say, uh, as COVID has really put a terrible, you know, a stop on all kinds of research. Even, I mean, anybody who's doing genealogical work can't get into archives. I mean, one thing after another. So I'm really hoping we can get past this because there's a lot of work to be done. And I know there are a lot of genealogists eager to get back to work because they call me on the phone <laughs> with questions they think I know because Dr. Yoder did, but never mind. It's okay. <laughs> I try to help them through that. Congratulations on setting up this center for people. It, it sounds like it's almost going to be like, in a way, a living history museum. I mean, just for food, but I, museum's not the right term. The house was built as a tavern, so it's always had a culinary history. And yeah. the tavern keepers were Pennsylvania Dutch. So, I mean, uh, but it's here in Devon, so there were all kinds of Welsh people. and So it has a wonderful mixed bag of its background. It's ideally built for ha it, it, three big parlors downstairs, great for dining rooms, huge area for a professional kitchen. And so the downstairs area will ba basically be lecture space and also dinners. I think what they really want to do, the, the board wants to have special dinners. So, you know, just for 20 people and we'll do a, one, a theme, you know, maybe Philadelphia dinner from the 18th century or whatever. This is something, of course, we can't do right now with COVID, but we're going to need a year or two to get this whole thing rolling in any event, And but it's going to happen. So uh, that's the good news. And it will be here at Roughwood. That's the name of the house that it received in the 19th century before, after it was the Lamb Tavern. So I write my books. I'm on book 21. I'm writing my culinary books in an old tavern. How, how good is that? <laughs> it, it's perfect. Just need some candlelight and you're all set. <laughs> I have some right now. <laughs> and a glass of wine. I always yeah, have there to you have, go. yes, yes, my bubbly. <laughs> right. Or Pennsylvania rye whiskey, if you really want to get. Oh, uh, oh, I would, I love <laughs> Pennsylvania rye whiskey, but I can't do hard liquor. So that's just, <laughs> I'll, I'll go with some Galen wineries there. They, they make very there. good Pennsylvania wine. So okay. They're up in Scruple County. What you said about COVID is just so heartbreakingly, I mean, something I can relate to and the loss that we've experienced. I, I It makes me wonder for people listening, what do you wish you could preserve or what do you wish, I guess, the next generation picks up and takes on in terms of what you've studied so far and what you're trying to preserve? Well, um, you know, I, I inherited the Roughwood Seed Collection from my grandfather and he started it in 1932. And that's more or less why I started to cook because I had all of these heirloom vegetables which also tell their own story. I did a book on that called Heirloom Vegetable Gardening. So there comes a point <laughs> At age 74, when you say to yourself, well, you know, I'm not Martha Stewart. I'm not going to live forever and run an empire. I have to get these things um, 
organized so that they can walk on their own two feet when I'm gone. And so that's basically why I've, I've decided this is the best way to go. If we set up an institute that has the seed collection where they can see the things growing in the garden, we have big gardens here, we can cook the food and we can talk about the ethnography, the cultural history here in the, in the old tavern. Then we've got a learning center and this is where young people can come and rediscover. I mean, we will become their grandmother and grandfather they never knew, let's put it that way. And uh, that's really what I like because I was teaching at Penn, University of Pennsylvania, and I was teaching at Drexel after that. And I had young people who grew up in suburbia and they never tasted heirloom vegetables at all. I mean, their parents bought things at the supermarket and that's all they knew. I did cooking classes when I brought that food in and I showed them how to cook with it. They were blown away. They had no idea that this world even existed. And to me, to see th their eyes light up and to become passionate about something, it was really good. I thought this, this is the kind of seed I wanna plant. That's exciting. Yeah, the world's so much more complicated and diverse than we know it to be these days, you know? Like, right, but the, yeah. the, the good thing is, if they get excited about this uh, food and its cultural history, then their kids will be. And, mm -hmm. and taking children out into the, the garden and showing them how things grow is one of the best ways that they can learn about food and not to waste it. I mean, I had a Quaker meeting come here once and they wanted to, they were doing herbs in the Bible, all right? So we walked them through the, the, the herb garden and they tasted all the herbs mentioned in the Bible. And this brought that whole text alive to them. And this is how you can use heirloom plants as part of a teaching thing. Yeah. Oh, that's a great idea. So yes. uh, any words of inspiration for people that might be thinking about starting a garden this year in 2021? <laughs> well, I'll say the, the Roughwood seed collection that we've got the seeds. All you have to do is go to roughwoodtable.org and you'll see what we've got. But if you've not done this before, my, my advice is start small. You know, start with lettuce or tomatoes or something easy, radishes, and get the hang of it. And then you can get on to more complicated things like cabbage, which you have to grow for two years to get seeds. But the nice thing about heirlooms is you can save back your own seeds and you don't have to buy them if you know what you're doing. And my, my book, Heirloom Vegetable Gardening, tells you how to do that. So yes, but it's a learning curve. I mean, I as many, as many books as I've written, I still every day wake up with and learn something new. And I like that. It's, it's just the way things go. And, you know, Don Yoder liked genealogy because he was a folk life person. And he felt that he was the father of American folk life. Let's put it that way that genealogy was a way of putting flesh on the bones of these people in the past who are very mysterious to us. And that brought up, brings us closer to the way they live. So genealogy has, is a great tool to tap into that kind of thing. But I use genealogy every day. I'm looking up obituaries of chefs or things like that, which put the dates on them and helps me pinpoint their place in history better. So uh, what you're doing, I absolutely think this is wonderful. And if you can get people to start using genealogy to do family research and to talk to relatives, they're gonna discover that some of those relatives are growing heirlooms and they're gonna get some seeds that way. And I think those seeds are more special because they come from your, your tribe, so to speak. That's what my grandfather did back in the 1930s. Oh, that's a wonderful thought. So yeah, genealogists out there, let's contact our cousins and see who we can connect with and start our tribe of seeds each. Yes. I think that's a, like a great project for this year. I, I know I'm looking for things that are obviously home-based and, and still connect me to my ancestors. I actually ordered your leek variety from Seed Savers. So I'm going to grow that this year. Very it's like, good. It's my eighth year of gardening, so I feel like I'm ready for the 
slightly oh, yes. more advanced. Leaks are a little more. <laughs> yes, you have graduated. You know, <laughs> this, you're going to get your PhD in leaks. <laughs> yeah, I love leaks. They've always been intimidating because they have a long growing season, and yes. you know, I'm like, ah, you know, I'm horribly impatient. So, I'll be staring at them to say, "Are you? How are you doing?" <laughs> But they're worth the wait. They're worth the wait. I know. I love them. I love yeah. them. And it's something that you just, they're not common to find in the store. So all the time. But William, is there anything else that you wanted me to ask you or anything else that you wanted to, to say? I, I do want to remind people too where your, where your books are so they can seed so they can get them. But You can order most of my books from the roughwoodtable.org. That is our our nonprofit foundation. We have a bookstore. We're also selling other out of print rare garden and cookery books, which we inherited from a man who died this past summer. And my out of print books like Pennsylvania Dutch country cooking, you can get off of Amazon. You can always go to Amazon, just type in my full name. There are millions of William Weavers, but there's only one William Woys. <laughs> That's true. That is true. I love it that you use your middle name because it did yes. make you easy to find. <laughs> yes, totally. <laughs> and there's only one of me. And I hope there's never two, because if I had a clone, we'd fight. <laughs> <laughs> William Woys Weaver, thank you again for being on. And I really hope this inspires genealogists to connect to their food history of their ancestors and you've provided them with a lot of great resources so they can do that. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. Don't forget to check out all of William's books over at woofroadtable.org. The link is in the show notes and there you will find both the heirloom seeds as well as William's books on how to grow those seeds and prepare the dishes that you're going to get from those vegetables. I hope this whole episode gave you lots of ideas on backgrounds of your ancestors and ways to fill out their history that's beyond the names and dates in the records. I also wanted to mention that I will update people uh, who are newsletter subscribers the second I hear about Dr. Don Yoder's library and archive that's coming to Kutztown University. I hope that's open in the next couple years. I always love a new archive, and I know you do too, where we might discover some great things about our ancestors. This is Denise Allen with PAAncestors.com, and I'm looking forward to a time when I can gather around with friends and family around a big table and share lots of fun foods and old time dishes, and I know you are too. I look forward to uh, sharing with you more ways that you can discover your Pennsylvania ancestors.